Welcome, everyone, and thank you to the Teaching with Technology Lightning Round. Um, thank you for attending. And um, on behalf of Technology Across the Curriculum, TAC, I would like to um, thank the Provost Office and IRT for sponsoring this event. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters for sharing their innovative explorations and for my co-chair, Gammon, um, for coordinating and moderating this event. Gammon? Well, I was going to thank all those people, too, so what, what Donna said, um, we're really happy to see such a big crowd this morning. I think it's a great sign that people are interested in what your peers are doing, teaching with technology. Um, I'm going to explain quickly how it works, and that is, this is a lightning round. Get it? Um, and what they do, we have made, they all made wonderful PowerPoint slides, and I put them together into a master PowerPoint. It's timed and they just have to keep up. It's going to be five minutes for each presentation, and you'll see we did have a rehearsal that went really well, and um, we're excited to kind of just get going with that. There's one thing that's, two things that are audience participation. We've, there's a slide for applause that's also timed after each person, <laughs> and for one of the presentations, if you didn't get your 3D glasses, we can still pass some out. I'll tell you when to put them on, all right? So before we get started, we have our honored guest, um, Mr. Provost himself, Warren's going to say a few words to us. A very few words, but you've already heard from Donna, you've heard from Gammon. I'm really excited to see the crowd here. You know, one of the things I noted in five years ago when I first got here, and I was just so impressed at the amount and the quality of support for the use of technology in the classroom. Whether it's as simple as something as, as making sure that people understand how Blackboard works, to more detailed of whenever I run into someone, they say, hey, this is a great idea. I say, yeah, call IRT, they'll help you. It's, it's really impressive on what people are able to do and what we're able to support here at the university. So I'm really excited and looking forward to see what all our presenters are doing and seeing how this will play out in the classroom. The year. <coughs> so thank you for attending. So our first speaker is Lynn Orr from the College of Education. She'll be talking about engaging students through technology with these three cool tools. Thank you, Gammon. Um, so today I like to incorporate three different methods of engaging students. I call them a little light and fluffy to um, introduce students to the topic of the presentation or to the first um, tool would be Wordle. And Wordle is something that you can create a word um, map with. And for this example, I worked with the higher education master's degree students and asked them what are three words that they think of when they hear the word assessment. So they responded and I put together the word map. And in the word map, the, the words that are repeated the most are the larger words. So you can see from this example that survey, analyzing, numbers, tools, data were the largest ones. So they were repeated across times. And then the smaller words that they included. So not as many people included those words. And on here is also the first day and then the last day to see if there's a change. So it's a type of informal assessment to see where the class is and judge where they're at and what they're thinking of assessment. So the next tool is Bitmoji. Bitmoji is an app that you can download onto your smartphone. And this is when I had students that were about 25 to 30, and they were very engaged in technology. And originally, I would say to students, OK, let me know what you're thinking of this class right now. And they would send a picture. And then this class came along, and they really liked the Bitmoji. They're like, oh, we'll send you a Bitmoji. So they would send it. It creates an avatar that they can adapt and change and create. So it makes it more personalized, and then attach their feeling to the word. So here are some examples that they sent during week number three. And then I'll show you examples of towards the end of the semester. So they downloaded their Bitmoji. They created their avatar. They adjust the clothing, the skin tone, the hair, the eyes. And then they send their Bitmoji to me representing how they feel about this course. A few examples here. So I got this, this is a good sign. 
right? So they're expressing themselves, they're engaged in the classroom, engaged with me, engaged with their classmates as well. Hitting the books is a good sign, okay? <laughs> Pray for me, a little hesitant about the class, but we'll see how you turn out or how she turned out at the end of the semester. And then we also have additional examples. I got this, feeling pretty strong and confident. Okay, so during week 15, the same prompt, how are you feeling about this class? And they emailed me their Bitmoji as well, and we'll see how they were feeling about the assessment class. Slam dunk, we're pretty, pretty positive here. We got this, nailed it. So those are all good signs that they uh, enjoyed or learned, they engaged in the class. A few more examples. It's lit fam, ha ha ha, right? Someone's a little puzzled or still trying to calculate some of, some of the quantitative assessment that we included. Some more responses. Not too sure about all of them, but we'll check in and make sure that they've met all the learning objectives for the class. And then the next or the last one is Pinterest. So a lot of students like to incorporate or use Pinterest. So why not bring out your smartphone and look on your Pinterest account and uh, incorporate it into the classroom. So this first example of Pinterest was in my public speaking class. The students have the opportunity to get up and speak and sometimes it's hard to come up with creative questions or responses they can talk about. So I referred to Pinterest and color psychology. So they looked up the color psychology to themselves and presented on that. The same idea for looking up for college success tips. Going through the college success tips and picking one and choosing that and explaining it to what they're going to work on throughout the classroom. So I'd like to thank you for coming to the session and have enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you, Lynn. Um, next up, we have Tom Heinsen from the Department of Psychology. He's going to show us, um, talk to us about information trails and game-based assessment. Thank you, a pleasure to see everybody. We went to the second side. So I'm gonna go, uh, higher education, as you may have noticed, is already a game. Uh, it's a pro very poorly designed game, however, and it means we rely on tr untrustworthy game mechanics. Game designers like to say that we don't design games, we design experiences. And the way we design experiences by designing <coughs> obstacles. So our job is to design obstacles, not to remove obstacles. And one of the nice things about game design is that it automatically creates assessment opportunities. So that here you only have to count how many people are using the stairs or the escalator. And that you can compare in a before after design. But the thing about game design is it becomes very natural. Now Sam Richman is a game designer who helped us assess whether our students can distinguish between psychological myths and scientific realities, which is a big deal in the teaching of psychology. So one of the things that she did was create a game in which you, people had to role play being a therapist and had to answer questions from clients. In this case, it was whether a boosting self-esteem would likely lead to higher grades. Now there's a scientific myth and a scientific, a psychological myth and an answer. Another is, should I go with my gut or would it be better to go over the answers? And again, the answer there is that there's a myth and a scientific answer and the therapist has to give the scientific answer in order to score well in this particular grain. This one is always popular. Uh, is it better to get, do you get rid of anger by punching a pillow or going for a walk? and many variations on that. Again, there's a scientific answer that contrasts with the popular myth. A lot of what you guys believe may not be true. Uh, uh, Stinkin' Thinkin' is a series of games that test whether our students can use critical thinking in everyday decision making. So it's really a transfer of learning issue. And the idea is that there's a story. Whenever there's a story, it's gonna be more engaging. In this case, the story involved a newly graduated major who is going to be uh, trying to get a job interview, so he's naturally anxious. 
So it's no surprise that he's anxious. This is a big deal. And so what does he do? He goes out to his car and he gets ready to go to the job interview. And I bet you can guess what's going to happen next. Perfect timing goes there. The car did not start. And of course, that's a very uh, difficult thing to deal with and the frustration is going to increase. And again, it doesn't have to be a great story. The evidence is that any story works better than no story. In this case, the emotional reactions are that she feels discouraged, she tries using her psychic powers to start the car, goes to slamming the hood, even turning the key very slowly, which I bet some of you have tried, and the car starts. So this little story has a happy ending because he feels like he's going to nail the end. He nails the interview. He gets offered a job. Everything is successful. He gets offered more money than he ever thought he would ever be offered. But there's one question. He still doesn't know what caused the car to start. Now, as a psychology student, he knows that we have these things called independent variables and dependent variables and confounding variables and extraneous variables. And he thinks, you know, this really ought to be something we could manage. But he also knows that correlation does not necessarily imply causation. So we're going to set him up to have to answer these questions and discern whether he really can answer the, these questions based on the data that he has. It arrives in a little game, uh, drag and drop game. So if you look at psyching using psychic powers, the player has to decide whether it's an independent, dependent, confounding, or extraneous variable. And think of all the things we can assess because everything we do leaves an information trail behind us. We can't live without leaving an information trail behind us. And being able to analyze that information trail is what we can do in our digital world. For example, with that drag and drop game, we can measure the number of attempts it took, the number of points earned, if that's the, how the game is set up, the accuracy of responses, which is basically the multiple choice test, but now we've got it times four, and whether the person is changing their strategy. So what we're working on in our lab is working on the problem of student retention, because if there's one thing that games do well, it's induce extraordinary degrees of perseverance, right? So if you want to help us out, just come and ask us to have a uh, survey in your class. Thank you. Speaking of surveys, um, you may be already inspired to use them in your courses, and Hussein Maratuk from my own department is going to tell you about Qualtrics. Hi, right, how you doing? Some of you might already be familiar with Qualtrics, but for those who are not, it's a tool that can be used to create surveys, whether for your courses as the instructor, by your students, or in your departments, and for research purposes as well. Anybody can use Qualtrics from students to faculty to staff, and they could use them for formative and for summative assessments. Formative occurring while the program is ongoing, summative at the end, to gauge how things well and how you could improve for the future. Qualtrics is meant to be a supplement, not a replacement, for the other assessment tools that you already have available. So you have your tests, whether they're in Blackboard or they're printed. You have your end of semester evaluations using Blue for online courses and Scantron for your traditional courses. To access Qualtrics, you make your way to WP Connect, log in, go to the Employee tab, in Information Technology, and you click on the link on the left-hand side near the bottom of the page. It reads Qualtrics Survey Research Suite. Once you're there and you've gone through the whole, I offer a pint of blood on my firstborn child, you click Create Project and it gets you started with creating the project, which you'll give it a name. And then once you've given it a name, it'll launch you into the part where you're going to start creating questions. The usual suspects of question types are available for multiple choice, including Likert scale, scale, excuse me, rank order, and so on, in addition to some specialty questions, including drill down questions. To create the question, it's incredibly easy. There's a green button, it's an intuitive process, you click create question, and if you've already created a few questions, you'll find in between each there's another button so that you can control where they're going to be placed. Those questions can be controlled so that not all the questions appear to all respondents. There's something called display logic, say only display if the answer to a previous question was fill in the blank, or skip if they provided a response to one of the questions. You could even automate what happens in terms of getting notified 
about a specific response to a question. So if there's something you want to know about right away, you could say, if they answer this, email me. I want to know about it. I want to take a look at this response. To distribute the surveys, the most popular and easiest way is to create a persistent link, which you could share either on a web page or you could send via email. Uh, there are other ways of, that Qualtrics facilitates, including sharing on a web page and providing the code for doing so, not just the link. To manage the results, you go to the report section, but the first section of the report section is actually just results. And the results are graphical representations that you can control. You could have pie charts, bar graphs, and so on. You can export those graphical representations into a variety of formats from PDF, Word, Excel. And if you download as the survey is ongoing, it saves each along the way. So you could see how you did in the middle and at the end of the process. For actual reports, or what Qualtrics calls reports, something that's printable and looks really nice, both on screen and on paper, you can set those up as well. You just go in and you set the parameters, which questions you want to include and which to exclude. And you could share them not only by creating the PDFs or printing them, but even by creating a link that can be shared with those who you want to have access to the reports. And if you want to have more control over it, you could set a password. The data. Reports are all good and well, but some of you really need to be able to drill down into the data. Well, you could export not only to Excel, Access, SPSS, and really analyze the data that you've gotten from your survey responses. And if you have trouble while you're using it, especially if it's at midnight or 5 in the morning and we might not be available, Qualtrics has a bunch of tutorials available that you will have access to at any moment. A lot of those tutorials are written ones. But there are also on-demand webinars, video tutorials that you could watch, where they go through the motions of a live webinar and answer a lot of the questions that you're likely to have when you're learning how to use Qualtrics. So they help different learning styles uh, between text and video. On campus, we have tutorials, one-on-one -on -one and group workshops. All you have to do is go to the IRT website, go to the CTT section, and you'll find a link to Qualtrics or you could wait for me to spam you with one of my announcements. And if you'd like to know more about it and schedule an appointment with one of us, you'll, you could always contact me directly at maritalkh at wpunj.edu or contact Tony Krasinski in IRT. Thank you. Thank you okay, time to put on your glasses as um, Zheng Wen Li talks to us about embracing the technology, virtual reality, and 3D printing in academia. Thank you, Yaman. So this is the, a 3D picture of a piece of a sodium channel. It's the one that actually makes us feel the world, an action potential thing. It's a small piece. And I can tell you that the depth, angle, and then the structure kind of really stands out. Just looking at it with a simple red and blue goggle. This is a full structure of that sodium channel, just the upper part. You can tell and you can see how complex it is, and it gives you that depthness of the structure, right? This is no longer a flat picture that you see from a textbook. That's what I want to bring to you. So it's now you're done. You take the box. <laughs> <laughs> so there are the VRs, ARs, and MRs, and there are so many beyond that that is actually making us a lot more like what? But we are, as overall, visual animals. What we see, it, it helps us. Now, an example of what they are is that this. <coughs> in the 90s, Star Trek had a, uh, a room called the Holodeck, if you, if you remember. This is a room where people will go in and, and, and a surreal world is created and they'll interact with it. That is a VR, where we cannot generate that at the moment, but we generate it this way, where a user can use uh, a headset, and they are now submerged into this virtual reality world, whether it is a geography, whether it's inside of a body. And so I want to talk to you about what it, what it is doing now and what it can be done for us. Here's an example of a burn unit, where the patient is being, uh, the dressing of the patient who, with a burn unit is, is getting changed. It's a tremendously painful uh, situation. The person is actually uh, using a goggle to see something, a cool world, which is like an icy world. That visual cue is actually alleviating the patient's pain sensation. Ooh, that flew by, but as overall, the pain is a lot lower. Now, what does the VR is being used? The green bar, gamers. Now, the, the dark ones, the health uh, and engineering, but then education is the least segment out of all those. I think we can use that for our advantage. This is a survey done by the Samsung Corporation about the use of the VR in the classroom. Upper left, you'll see that 62% of the teacher will say, I think it'll do a great job for our teaching. 
74 says that, that the student learning experience will be enhanced. Bottom right, it tells you that different subjects that you can use. Here is a school in Virginia who's actually using that. These are kindergarten students who are using VR apparatuses. They will be knocking our door in about 12 years. I think we should be ready for them, technology-wise as well as content-wise. So how do we get involved in that? Very, very messy situation. There are different content makers, there are different soft makers, and different hardware makers. But simplifying this, I'll show you that it's, it's not that complicated. We can actually bring this thing to our curriculum and then make it happen in our room. How do we do that? Cardboard is the first one that we used about six, seven years ago. It's a simple, uh, in a uh, low cost way to bring VR to classroom just using your smartphone, which how we did it. So you uh, use uh, one of those Google's smartphones and then plug it into a cardboard and you were there. A lot of uh, elementary schools and middle schools are already using that. But now, this is the <coughs> latest one. It's a head-mounted gear with an interactive handle that you can actually get submerged. Microsoft is actually a leader in that. This is called a HoloLens, where the goggle is actually projecting a, a virtual world inside of the real world. So you can actually interact both the real and surreal without tripping over on a floor. Mm -hmm. And these are the, the main makers, or major makers that are uh, on the market now. And I think the market will change really, really quickly because they've been around for several years already. Uh, HTC, Oculus being um, um, uh, major players now. But what do we need to actually make that happen in our classroom? Software. And it turns out that all the software, the expensive ones, are actually freely available to us, to all of us in academia. That is uh, uh, Autodesk Stingray, uh, uh, real-time rendering engine that we use it both in the sciences as well as in the arts uh, uh, colleges. And so this is a quick summary of what do we need. A VR computer, which is not that expensive. A headset, which is getting a lot more affordable nowadays, and then a software, which is for us, is freely available to use for any one of us, and then you guys, uh, the drive and the creativity to make the content happen, to teach this content to our next generation, leading to the 3D printing. 3D printing has come a long way which in medicine. That, that her name is Lily, and she actually got through a, a face surgery with a 3D printing. The time was cut down by a couple of hours. IRT already has a 3D printing lab. We just need our courses to offer to our students. I am creating a UCC course in 3D printing where we'll teach our, our students, both sciences and education, to use that tool to teach the next generation of uh, our upcoming students. This is a book that my nephew, who's 11, showed me on Minecraft, and each chapter ends with a quote. And this is one of the quotes from that 11-year-old's book. It says, when the world changes, you should change with it. Um, our 3D print lab does not print skin yet. <laughs> so next is Dr. David Freestone, learning in a tech-driven world. He's talking about things he's using in his classes this semester for problem solving with technology. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about, I have two learning classes, and I noticed over the years that we live in an increasingly tech-driven world. So I want to talk to you about how I structure my learning classes around that. There's Netflix and Pokemon Go and Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook. And, and we all know these and we all use these routinely. Twitter is becoming uh, kind of a necessary tool in science so I can continually, continuously get updates about the new science that's going on and what I should pay attention to. Farmers need to pay attention to this now because their tractors work on digital uh, digital software and so farmers are hacking their tractors in order to have some say in how their tractors work. And this is a world that we live in. Smart toasters exist where you can you can decide on how burnt you want your toast from your phone and I want to point out that there are nine different ways to share your views with one click. That's the world that we live in now. It's an awesome world. Social media gives students a voice and a platform to do some amazing things. But I wonder about how much these skills that they learn in social media translate into something like the business world. So what I've done in my class is design it around the goal of having students think critically about and thrive in this tech-driven world. I want my students to be able to communicate effectively across these different types of platforms. So what I do, what I do is I design the course around solving real world problems. And in order to solve those problems, they have to not only so design a solution, but they have to professionally communicate that solution to others. So we do a series of six problems in the class, 
And each one of those problems was originally solved with principles of learning. And the students have to d draft, design, and reflect on each of those problems so that the problems build on each other. For example, Pokemon Go, most of the students know about. It's just an animal foraging problem. It's a learning problem. So we talk about how animals select prey, how we search Google, we talk about the theory behind it, and then they have to design the winning Pokemon Go strategy. Part of what this does is it allows them to see that many problems have the same underlying structure, and if you solve one problem, you've solved all the problems with that same structure. And it, it allows them to see, uh, see this in, in interesting places. Here are two examples. This one a student did with PowerPoint, and this one a student did with the Word newsletter feature. And they created, this is how you should play Pokemon Go. They integrated learning theory with it. Another problem is uh, marketing. Marketing is a value learning problem disguised as a celebrity. So we talk about value learning, Pavlovian conditioning, how habits form, how we get addicted to drugs. And then they have to use that information to design the most marketing, the most compelling marketing platform. This group designed their own website and implemented the website for uh, gym equipment. And then they made an Instagram to further promote their product, taking what we learned in the classroom and then evaluating it. The thing about it is that my other class evaluates the product. My other class holds a marketing review panel to see which marketing campaign they should fund. They play Pokemon Go with the other, uh, with the other strategy to see who wins. We communicate using Slack, where both of my classes can communicate in one long chat stream. Somebody asked a question, what's the format of Pokemon Go? And it, it caused a flurry of responses that everyone can get in on. The thing of it is, I don't teach how to design a social media platform or how to design a marketing platform. I teach principles of learning. It's their job to figure out how it applies and then apply it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And our next presenter is coming up to the podium. Um, Cynthia Northington Purdy from the Department of Secondary and Middle School Education. <coughs> We're gonna let her go off the PowerPoint to, to show you a demonstration of her. Oh, it? Hmm? The, it goes it? automatically. Oh, my goodness. Okay, hi, Paltoons. What is it? Um, yeah, it's presentation <laughs> software. Why do I use it? I use it because I teach online, and I was trying to figure out ways to make teaching online not dull. Okay, as you can tell, I've only been talking for about 30 seconds, and I'm, you can tell that I'm a, I'm a performer, all right? So, you know, I, I do better face to face. So I said, what can I do? You do that. Oh, wait a minute now. No, that, no, no, no. That was, sorry about that. Don't clap yet. So what happens is, because she's doing it differently, sorry, we're just going to go uh, here. Yeah, the, we're getting right back up like the figure skaters that fall Good down. heavens. <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm doing now. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, so, yeah, I'm, this old dog is learning new tricks all the time. Animation keeps people, uh, it gets people's attention from children to, to the elderly. You know, there's something about the color of it. The, uh, it's just wonderful. And, and um, so, it, and you know, I found also as a mother of, of little kids, um, it help, makes them read. It helps them to read. I, as a child, my mom would, would uh, get angry at my dad for buying me comic books, but the comic books had me reading. You know, so I mean, you gotta, you gotta look at it because my mom would say, that's not literature. No, it wasn't, it was Richie Rich, but hey, I was reading. And the point is, we have to, we have to figure out, meet them where they are and figure out how to get their attention. Powtoons does that. Okay, so um, here's this. You, you, these are easy to make. PowerPoint is like so five minutes ago, all right? Everybody's doing it and it's boring. This is interesting. Okay, so you set it up the same way as you would a PowerPoint. It, does, it works in slides. It goes in slides, one after the other when you set it up. Once you set it up, you can add um, voiceover, which I frequently do for my online courses. Okay, so if you'll, you'll notice I have the music on. Really quick, see how quick that was? Oh, okay. 
Okay, so, okay. Ah! You can up. You can embed video. Greetings. <laughs> <laughs> this is CISE two nine five zero. Yeah, at Psych. But you can within just like you would with PowerPoint, you can embed the video and it goes it goes right over into the into the um to the video. And then we just going back here and start. The video. And it's easy to click back too. You can set it up so that the video plays in the slide, but I didn't have time to do that this morning. It makes these charts that move, pie graphs, line graphs that are uh, animated. Created using Powtoon. Okay, a word about that. I d I'm using the free version of Powtoons. So if you use the free version of Powtoons, you have to use, deal with the logo. I don't care about the logo. It doesn't bother me. If it bothers you, it, you have to pay like $20 a month, which I think is prohibitive. <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. See, that was light and a nice way to end. But wait, there's more. Um, our panelists have agreed to do a little question and answer. So while they're coming up to sit in their fancy seats for that, I'm going to shut down the thing and you'll think of your questions. I'd also like to um, put out some more thanks. Thank you to Donna Pataco for setting up this event as well. Um, and thank her especially for the food out there. She was able to get that set up. Um, I'd like to thank BPS and Media Services for running all of the recording and also helping out um, with the equipment in the room and Mike just saved the day with the Powtoons. And um, we're, we're gonna have this whole presentation online, including the PowerPoint as well. So if you wanna talk to your friends about how great it was, um, we can, we'll be sending out that link. So this is our brand new catch box. Is it on? It's on. Is it on? This is what we're gonna use for the question and answer. Don't be afraid, it's very soft. If you don't catch it, it's okay. Um, we just thought that would be a fun way to do our Q&A. So who's got the first question and is brave enough to catch? <laughs> Come on. They're sitting here with all their expertise. So um, the panel up there represents an, a lot of different silos on the university. And I was wondering if any of you have an idea how you can use a game to get you guys, me, uh, the rest of us, so that we don't stay in our silos, but we actually get our students to do the Pokemon game and uh, start looking with the biology majors to find out who is better at anatomy and physiology. And if you have any ideas on that. Yeah, I can say something, I think. Um, can people hear me? Um, I, I suppose one way to do it is to think about these problems as multifaceted, right? So um, you need more than just learning to solve these problems, although I picked the ones for which learning was um, the key component. So you design the problem, in, in my particular case, right? You might design the problem so you need a little bit of psychology and you need a little bit of biology. And so the students have to go out and now learn two things and integrate two things into solving the problem. Um, I think that's, that's kind of it from my point of view. Yeah, I think the same thing um, from the science point of view. In, in biology, uh, uh, my view is that the students are, are, are craving interactivity. Instead of just this one plain textbook picture or just a PowerPoint on, on a wall, they want to do something that they can actually move, touch, handle, swing around. And that's where the augmented reality comes in. This is the one where you can actually put your phone on top of an object and then a virtual bone or a skull or, or, or object uh, will, will pop up and they can actually turn around, swing around, and then see different sides of the object. One of the things that I actually personally learned is that while I was making one of those 3D printing models for uh, one of the Michelangelo's <laughs> sculpture, it's, it's uh, Moses, I believe. Uh, was it Moses? Yeah, it was Moses, I believe. And uh, as it was printing, and I've seen that picture for a long time you know, over, over the internet, and then as I was printing it, and once it was done, I looked at it and, and realized on, on the head of the Moses, actually there were two horns coming out. I didn't know that there was a horns on, on, the, on the head of the Moses, but there was a meaning behind it that the Michelangelo added. And so those are the little details that you don't get to see from a, just a, a plain picture. But if you have that object, tangible object in front of you, you could explore all of it. Yeah, from my view, game design gives a theoretical frame around a lot of what you saw 
because the first principle of game design is that we are delivering an experience and then we let the experience do the teaching. And I think that's sort of the fundamental way that we're coming to with all of our technology. And Tom, you made the great point that the teaching and learning process is already a game. And as soon as yeah. we realize that and can do it in more thoughtful ways, more deliberate ways, we could really improve that experience for the students. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty easy to figure out that we are a game, but we're a very poorly designed game. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we can, there's plenty of room for improvement, as we all know. <clears throat> Come up here and throw it gently. <laughs> okay, so first I'd like to just uh, thank all the presenters. Um, I have two questions. One is to Lynn. Um, so my question to Lynn is, uh, do the class uh, participants see each other's Bitmojis or do they just go to you? Do they respond to each other? And then um, do you use Wordle live in the classroom? Like is the word cluster formed immediately and are there any complications in terms of downloading apps for the students? So just sort of talk through that process. And then I was wondering um, if the participants were going to be setting up like a Blackboard page with some of their um, class assignments and how they actually gamify and incorporate those things into the assignments or if they would be willing to do that? Question mark there. Thanks. So the Wordle, I usually have one person in the class go to wordle.net and they'll create it live. So right there they'll come up with it and then they'll email it and then I'll project it. For the, as far as the Bitmojis, the presentation that I did today, I took the pieces from that. So I'll do the uh, three words from Wordle. I'll include that in a PowerPoint, and then I'll include each of the pictures, their Bitmoji, and then at the end, do the Wordle again, and then the Bitmoji. So I put it all together almost as a gift to the students to see how they progressed, and they, they enjoy that. With the Wordle, um, it's, it's good if you repeat, you have, if you have the bank of words already, it's good if you repeat the words over and over again, and then it'll fill a shape, any shape you want, which is right. really impressive. But if you just have the words listed once, it's just going to be scattered about on the page. So you want to repeat them several times so that they fill out the cloud. I enjoyed all the presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious as to how you share your expertise with your peers, your faculty peers, and then do you have any ideas about how we can share this across the university with all the faculty? Well, I talk about game design to any damn person who will <laughs> let me. Uh, because I think it is an organizing framework that we can all apply across our various silos. And so I've done the student success, you know, the different groups that are there. And especially talking about student retention, which is, as you know, a major issue. If you're worried about that, please, you know, call us in. We'll do everything we can. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. You know, if you're having, I'm one of those people where, yeah, pretty much if you, anybody who wants to know, I'll tell you. I love designing these programs. I love designing these, uh, the, the Prezi's, the, even, even PowerPoint. You know, you can do some really creative stuff with PowerPoint. It doesn't just have to be bullet points. <gasps> Drives me crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll come to your, your uh, office or you can come to mine with your computer and we can just make your um, presentation really sexy. I think, uh, uh, yeah, please. I think uh, another thing that William Patterson actually does really well is um, you can visit each other's classes. So last week I sat in on a constitutional law class, which has nothing to do with what I study. But I got some good ideas on how to get, uh, how to get students to read uh, the material. Um, and so I, I'm, I imagine many of us would be willing uh, and happy if you came to talk to us uh, in our classes and give us tips and, and, and engage with us about this stuff. And while I teach in the English department, full-time I'm an instructional technologist in the Center for Teaching with Technology. And I bring that up not just because we're there and available to assist you with how to use this in your courses, but because our group workshops allow you to interact with each other and learn from each other. So they're great opportunities to see what your peers are doing. Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, specialties uh, and backgrounds that, that we all have both in, uh, in the audience as well as in the panelists. And one of the questions that even I myself have 
have been asking myself is, where do I start? Like, I want to do this, but then how do I start? And, and, and I think that comes with our communication. Like, for example, the virtual reality, augmented reality, or mixed reality, uh, these are tools that some people are comfortable uh, and some people are not. <coughs> And it and but that potential of making that connection between the sciences to to education to psychology, I think it'll, it'll foster a great um, build. Yeah, and and Brenda's first question was about the silo problem, right? And the organization on campus that naturally covers all those silos is Gammon's department and the IRT folks. So in term, if that's our goal, that's one way we can start approaching it. I think part of my method is being creative and open to creativity. So the same thing that Cynthia was saying with the PowerPoint, you kind of get bored with it. So if you've taught, instructed the same workshop or presentation or class, I get kind of bored with it. So I try and come up with more creative ideas. What type of game can I incorporate? How can I get them involved with technology? So having the freedom to be creative is what, and I've done presentations on that in professional associations, and as well as what I talked about today or, or engagement online, I've done presentations on that. What, uh, when I do uh, staff development in the uh, schools, I get people really angry because, you know, I've been teaching, this is my 32nd year of teaching, and I tell them, listen, if you are still teaching the same way you did 20 years ago, you're not good anymore. You're not. Because, and then, and, and complaining that kids won't, won't pay attention. Because the kids have changed. Times have changed. Technology has changed. The only, the only ones who haven't changed is us. Hmm. We've got to get on board with this. It's not them. It's us. On that note, let me actually reverse the situation. How many of people in the audience actually are interested in using 3D printing? or oh, augmented reality or virtual reality for your classes. Yeah, if there's a demand, there's always a way. So you won't be surprised I have something to add to answer this question. Um, you can come to events like this to learn what your peers are doing, of course. Um, it's possible that these folks and folks like them using technologies in their teaching might be asked to co-lead workshops in the CTT, which they don't know until now they know. Um, <laughs> Our CTE folks are sitting over here waiting to help you with your teaching, and this is all involved with pedagogy as well, so we've been collaborating. Um, since we're right next door to each other, that's a pretty easy thing, but they do great work as well. And finally, at some point in the future, two things. Media services, you, if you walk by there now, you'll see there's a bright orange wall instead of whatever dull color it was before. Very dingy white. This color. We are reconfiguring that desk to do a lot of new things, and. Um, Mainly it will, well, we'll let you know what that's going to be, but it will be to support students as they learn digital skills and also faculty to kind of make sure the students are doing the right things. And we'll, you'll see more of that to come in the future. Finally, um, we're starting what I'm calling in a very lofty way the Digital Literacy Initiative, um, which is in its very, very young infancy. And so we're going to start having a few, we hope that it will be ground up and we're going to have a meeting March 6th, is that right? Tuesday, March 6th at 3 o'clock in University Hall 122. I will email this to all of you who signed up on the list today. This is just to start a conversation um, about how we can help our students with digital skills going forward and incorporating that into our curriculum. So um, please come to that event if you're interested in doing that as well. And finally, Gary, you can ask a question. Thank you. I didn't forget my question. But it's a good segue, because um, actually my question is multi-part. Um, you guys are, are creating these things for, um, for instruction purposes. Are, are, are any of these um, kind of using a AR or VR or the Powtoons designed for students to learn how to use them and create them? Like, um, do you have assignments where students have to create a, a presentation using Powtoons in an online class? Or if they're creating AR tools and things to, so that they're actually not just using the software, but learning how to create the materials themselves? Well, yes, because we're preparing them to go into the classroom and be teachers themselves. And um, in order to hold the attention of today's child, you've got to be a magician. And so you need all these tools. Sure, you're not going to do you know, the same thing. You're not going to do um, a VR presentation every day, or you're not going to, but 
when you mix it up like that, you appeal to everybody's learning style. Yeah, the, the UCC course that I'm, I'm creating now, it's not about, about the end product, but actually it's like a designing and then using and manufacturing. So it, the, the software, the use of the software will be taught as well as the use of the hardware for the printing component also will be taught. So at the end of the class, the person will know uh, uh, how to design it, how to build it, and how to manufacture it, and how to create that final object. And the 3D printing lab is open to the students, not just to the faculty and staff members. So they're all welcome to use it, ideally for academic purposes. There's another software out there that I think we could probably get a license to. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but um, called Go Animate that I've used pretty successfully. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah it's it's nice, right? It's, awesome. um, it's students build a video with sort of cartoon characters, and they can write text, which is a writing assignment, but uh, but they don't really realize it because they're writing it in for these characters. Um, I've used that pretty successfully over the last couple of years, too. I don't know if anyone else has. You've, yeah. yeah, you've used it, too. Oh, so yeah. That's yeah, what I great. used, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. It, it's it's yeah. great for online teaching. When you're teaching online, it's another tool to use if you have to teach an online class. Yeah, I was going to say, I think David's course, as he described it, they're learning a lot of those skills in the process of participating in the course. And there's a host of skills they were learning in his class that, uh, you know, just come as part of the way he's organized and structured the class. So one of the interesting things about that is that I never told them that they should make a PowerPoint um, or an infographic or anything like that. I just tell them to, you know, since you're going to be evaluated by your peers, you have to be understood by your peers. You've got to find the right medium to talk to them in. Um, and, and for the very first assignment, one person, one group uh, gave that PowerPoint, um, that infographic. And another set of people said, I didn't know that we could do this. And then they all started producing high quality work like that too. Um, so they, you know, they decide on what the right presentation mode is. They go out and learn that presentation mode, um, and, and that's that's kind of how I build it in. We have students in a history of psychology class who are making films of famous events in this history of psychology. So if you ever want to see little Albert in diapers, <laughs> this is your chance. No? Oh, okay. Any other questions? Or are you just wondering if they still left the coffee out and the snacks? <laughs> Donna, do you want this or? I, I have a big mouth. <laughs> um, I was wondering, are any of you using it for research applications with your students? Yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if there were any projects going on, because I know um, at the Qualtrics workshop they right. mentioned that they were using it, um, the, the Qualtrics, I know, for um, <coughs> for students, if you remember who's saying, I don't Sorry. remember exactly what they mentioned they were doing already. Mm -hmm. How do I sell Qualtrics to my students who use SurveyMonkey and, and the, the Google Form platform? SurveyMonkey, they only have the ability to use the free product, right? So right. it gives them limited access to the data. It requires that they create a separate account outside at the university. They're already in Qualtrics, and it's an incredibly easy program to use and gives a whole lot of flexibility okay. in terms of how to manage and share the data. Google's free also and, or, and offers sure. a lot of different question types and gives some data that you can aggregate. Sure, and, and I would never spend any amount of time telling them Google is bad. Instead, I'll show them what Qualtrics can do. Okay. Okay. You can actually make rudimentary games in Qualtrics. Really? Yeah, and you can also uh, analyze their information trails as they play. And it's very good statistically. So there's, you know, it's an ex if we don't keep up, yeah. you know, they're going to stop coming if we don't keep up. Uh, with 3D printing, 3D printing is being used extensively in medicine, for example, jaw reconstruction, facial bone reconstruction, or even hip bone reconstruction. I think there was a one student from Rutgers, actually, he printed his own teeth, and then he put it in for about two weeks before <coughs> it fell off. So <laughs> in, in my case, I am using that concept to, uh, to incorporate into my research, uh, which I cannot say right now, but it is being used in that concept. Do you have time? Maybe one more question if you have it. Do you need your 3D glasses back? Thank you. No, that, that's a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs>
sign it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you.